Um, bonjour à tous, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julia Deans and I'm the president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity Canada. Uh, I'm coming to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. Uh, it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. On behalf of uh, everybody at Habitat for Humanity Canada and our local habitats across the country, I'd like to thank our special guest today, Mr. Brad Beese, who is the MP for Mission Matsqui Fraser Canyon, and also the Shadow Minister for Housing uh, for joining us today. Uh, for also joining us today, I'd like to thank our panelists, Tim Richter, who is President and CEO of the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, and Kevin Albers, Board President of the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association and CEO of Macola Housing Society and Macola Development Services. This is the second conversation we've convened with a parliamentarian to speak to the priorities and vision for affordable housing in Canada. Each of these discussions is informed by the perspective of the party in the House of Commons for which this member or MP has been elected. Brad Beats, with his responsibility for housing in Aaron O'Toole's shadow cabinet, has graciously offered to share his vision of what may form part of the next Conservative campaign platform. As we approach this second year of the uh, pandemic, due preparation for every event, including an election, is top of mind for all parties in the House of Commons. And I know we're looking forward to hearing more about how we might work together with a Conservative government to advance our shared objectives. At Habitat Humanity for Canada, we've been working with families who want to build equity and achieve stability and self-reliance for over 35 years. We have over 50 local habitats operating across the country, and we've become a strong and vital presence among organizations committed to advancing affordable housing across Canada. We were fortunate to receive a significant three-year commitment from the Government of Canada through the National Co-Investment Fund uh, to partner and advance the national housing strategy and additional funding in December focused on creating homes for black families. We continue to work with all partners and all orders of government and parties to build on this, this momentum. But these are extraordinary times as I'm sure all of us, including our guest panelists today can attest to. So now let's get going. Uh, by way of introductions for, um, for those who have joined us, I'd like to first introduce Brad Beese. He was born in Matsqui, BC, and has deep roots in the Fraser Valley. He has spent the majority of his career working in government, politics, and the agribusiness sector. And his professional background extends to communications, public relations, and policy development. He was elected in 2019, having earlier served as a, a, a senior staff to Ed Fast, uh, so he's a lot, got a long history in Ottawa. And uh, Brad is honored to represent all residents of Mission Matsqui Fraser Canyon and work hard on their behalf. He says that his mission is to raise issues and work to accomplish the goals of the riding in Ottawa rather than work as Ottawa's representative in the riding. Under the leadership of the Honorable Aaron O'Toole, Brad Beats serves as the Conservative Party Shadow Minister for Housing, which is a standalone portfolio which shows their increased focus on this issue. He's also a member of the HUMA Committee, the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills and Social Development and the Status of Persons with Disabilities. Let me uh, now introduce Tim Richter, who is the President and CEO of the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. The Alliance's mission is to lead a national movement of individuals, organizations, and communities to end homelessness in Canada. Tim is a leading national voice on housing and homelessness policy, housing first, and ending homelessness. And he's also serving as co-chair of CMHC's new Housing Advisory Council. Prior to joining the Alliance, Tim was president and CEO of the Calgary Homelessness, excuse me, Homeless Foundation, where he was responsible for leading the implementation of Calgary's 10-year plan to end homelessness, which was the first plan of its kind in Canada. And interestingly, uh, Tim also used to serve on the board of Habitat for Humanity Southern Alberta, which we appreciated. Kevin Albers has two roles. He's the uh, board president for the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association and CEO for the Macola Housing Society and Macola Development Services, which is the largest uh, provider of Indigenous housing in BC and, and I think in, in Canada. 
In both of these roles, Kevin is an important voice and thought leader on the future of affordable housing, well known for leading with innovative ideas and creative solutions. Kevin has been a catalyst in getting so many new housing projects off the ground, and he's paved the way for many housing providers through creative partnership. So a very warm welcome to you all. And uh, we like to start off these sessions by posing a question and I'll pose it to you first, um, Brad. What does home mean to you? What does home mean to Brad this? I'll, uh, well, that was a very personal question because a home is a very personal thing. Um, so let me share a uh, story. I guess I was about, um, I was in university and uh, I was, I'm the, I come from a background where I'm 18, I was out of the house and I was on my own. And um, I was uh, staying at a friend's house in between semesters, looking for a new place to rent in Vancouver where I was at UBC to uh, complete my bachelor's degree. And the mother of my friend said, Brad, and I was a little frustrated at the time. And uh, my, my friend's mother said to me, uh, Brad, you're, you gotta, you got to find your own place and you got to make it your own home and you got to just build up from there. And uh, at the time that was, that was really important to me. And, and it's, and I've had lots of different homes in my life. Um, but home, I guess now is building a legacy for my children and uh, trying to get through the very, very extensive, uh, expensive real estate market that I live in, in, um, in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Um, but to answer the question, home is just a building a place where I'm comfortable and I feel safe and that a place where my children can thrive. Thank you. I wasn't expecting a question like that. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be fun if we didn't have some questions like that. Um, over, over to you, uh, Tim. Well, I was just gonna say what he said. So what, what Brad said, I think is a good way to put it. But I, you know, for me, uh, a home home isn't uh, home is less about uh, the four walls and the roof. And uh, I think the home to me is, you know, a place where uh, I can we can live in peace. We can we can be among our uh, among our people, and we can raise our families and take care of our our health. But I was uh, the, your question made me think of. Um, uh, something Jesse Thistle said. He's uh, uh, you may have met him. He's a Indigenous scholar and in, uh, at uh, York and an author of a a, a terrific uh, a terrific book. But he says, you know, ending the definition of homelessness for Indigenous people and ending homelessness really means you know bringing people back into the circle, right? And and I think a home is a place where it's our personal circle where we're with our people and we can be comfortable live and uh, and thrive thank you and and i agree jesse's book is amazing i read it i just finished it about two weeks ago and i would highly recommend it to everybody over to you kevin so, <laughs> there we go <laughs> i'll start off with uh, acknowledging the traditional territory of the lakwangan speaking people where i'm situated here uh, in victoria and more specifically the songhees and esquimalt nations and want to uh, thank them for allowing us to live work celebrate and provide affordable housing for british columbia's on their traditional territory um i so i have the most amount of time to think about this um so i, I guess the way i would define it is that uh, home is really about security, it's about safety, it's about stability. Um, along Tim's lines, I mean, it means family, it's, it's, it's what, it, what a community is made of. It's really a foundation for choice and opportunity of, of the people that, that live in the home. And, you know, it's coming from CHRA and from McCullough Housing Society, it's something that we believe every Canadian should have affordable and sustainable access to. I mean, that's, that's really why we're all here. Um, and I, I think that just over the last number of years and, and really decades of a lack of vision and investment in affordable housing, it's why we're here and now it's, a, it's the top topic of almost any news report or um, you know, media um, conversation, it, housing tops the list and, and, and rightfully so. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and turning you back to Brad, uh, not everybody's a political junkie and not everybody knows what a shadow housing minister does. Can you just tell us what, what, what is a shadow housing minister and, and what has been the focus of your work since you took on that important role? 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, the Conservative Party is the official opposition in, in Canada's parliament. And the number one role of the official opposition is to give, uh, is to criticize and critique the government and to provide uh, another vision of what our country could look like at this uh, certain point in time. Um, we need to be, to be seen and we need to act and behave and do everything as a government in waiting so that Canadians have confidence in our party to, to form government and serve on their behalf. Aaron O'Toole appointed me as shadow minister for housing because when he became leader of the Conservative Party, he understood it's an area of the party that we needed to focus on more and to show Canadians that we care about the full continuum of housing that under Stephen Harper, when we said uh, how, when we when we created a housing first policy, that we put some more things into action and demonstrate to Canadians that we we really care about where they're at, and uh, we want to help them along the way, and that uh, we're going to put together a set of policies that are going to respond to the the crises we find in many communities across this country. And you're muted, my friend. I actually have a little a little sign that I hold up now that says, um, but I know one of your responsibilities is is to help develop that platform for the yeah. Conservative Party. Can you tell us where you're at in the development of that platform and and uh, um, uh, and 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 maybe describe some of the the process and 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 how how people can contribute to that. Yeah, well, first off, if anyone's listening on this call who has something they want to share with me directly, um, brad.vis at parl.gc.ca, I have been consulting broadly across uh, the country over Zoom uh, the last number of months, getting a handle on all aspects of housing in Canada. Um, in terms of where we're at in the platform development stages, I, I think we're just a couple of days away from our first draft. Um, so we've been working really hard and also combining some of the stuff that we've been doing at committee into the recommendations that I will be putting forward through our decision making process in the party and sharing with my colleagues. But I can give you a couple of points about some of the things I'm thinking about right now. Should I continue? Please. <laughs> okay, so first off, the national housing strategy. Are the Conservatives going to scrap it? No, I'm not going to recommend that. Um, I think that we need to um, continue uh, with those investments. But as a Conservative, I also believe that we can be doing better. And even in committee, Adam Hussein, Minister Hussein mentioned to me, Amit, um, that the government could be doing better on the housing co-investment fund. Now, I'm very pleased to see that Habitat for Humanity has been able um, to access those funds. But for many Canadians across this country, um, navigating these new programs has been very challenging. Um, so I believe that CMHC has to be a little more accountable to Canadians and proactive in helping them uh, help others. And so that's going to be a big focus of what I, I recommend to the uh, leader of the Conservative Party and my shadow cabinet colleagues. Um, on the rapid housing initiative, right now we're, we just received notice that there was over 700, uh, 765 applications that were accepted into the program uh, for the program-based funding, which is $500 million. Um, obviously, those 765 programs far exceeds the um, a number of dollars that are actually available and the number of programs which can be funded. Having seen um, the Par Parliamentary Secretary Vaughan and Minister Hussein come forward this, with this program and see the demand, what can the Conservative Party do to help those organizations that are ready to get things built today? And what does this say about the national housing strategy only a few years in that we've had to start a new program to move past the application, to um, remove the previous application process to get things done quickly? So I'm looking really closely at that. Um, more broadly on economic development and federal infrastructure funding, I believe it's incumbent upon the Government of Canada moving forward to set stricter criteria for municipalities across Canada that, we, um, that they meet uh, the needs uh, of Canadians th uh, through 
zoning requirements. And maybe um, as we've suggested in previous elections, and as I will note, uh, numerous organizations and chambers of commerce across Canada have suggested and agreed with me uh, that we uh, start tying federal infrastructure dollars to meeting housing demands of the federal government to ensure that families can live closer to where they're working and to leverage the massive infrastructure investments that, that every political, every government of Canada puts forward, but making sure that there's a housing component in the criteria. Um, I would also say that we need to address closely data, uh, rural and remote housing. Uh, as we've learned, uh, there's not enough data in Canada to account for poverty in the north, um, uh, to account for the acute housing challenges that are faced there. And CMHC isn't doing that work now, so we need to do some of the foundational stuff too. And then bottom line, as part of Canada's economic recovery, and I know I'm speaking way too long now, uh, that we need to have affordable and supportive housing needs to be part of an economic recovery in Canada because we can't have good workers if good workers don't have a good place to live. Thank you. Well, uh, I, 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 there, I think there's lots of virtual nods. We had a bingo well said uh, in the chat. So, so um, uh, thank you for kicking things off with uh, such a robust answer. And may I say, if, um, if you're listening and you have a question, uh, uh, we have a chat. We're not going to have it popping up on everybody's screens, but I'll be keeping a very close eye on the chat. So do let us know if you have a question that you want to share or comment. Um, but why don't I turn things over to you, Kevin, just to, to continue with a couple of questions. Good. Thanks, Julia. Um, Brad, uh, you mentioned the National Housing Strategy. You mentioned a couple of the pillars within the National Housing Strategy. Um, I, I'd really like to know where the Conservative Party's stance is uh, to ensure that the National Housing Strategy continues to do what it was intended to do. But more importantly, what are your thoughts about how you can support the uh, inclusion of an urban, rural and northern Indigenous strategy within that strategy? We find it, um, well, very unfortunate to say that we have a national housing strategy that's actually a void of a specific strategy geared towards urban, rural, and northern Indigenous peoples of this country, and just would really like to hear what the Conservative government's uh, plans are around that. Yeah, so that those ex the exact nature of those recommendations are being developed at this very moment. But if you want to know a little bit more about what I said and the people I invited to our study, uh, you're going to be able to have a fulsome understanding of some of the approach I'm taking. And I was actually about I was going to continue on and actually uh, talk about the uh, study before I realized I was speaking too long um, before. But but generally, the proposal of a for indigenous uh, by indigenous housing strategy has been supported by many and I believe it has merits and needs to be studied further. And where I believe there's an intersection with the Conservative Party is that Conservatives across Canada believe in responsible government, in many cases, limited government. In the case of Indigenous, uh, indigenous nations across this country, what are they trying to do in all aspects of their life? It's getting the federal government out of their way so they can live their best lives in the way that they see fit and move past the Indian Act. I, I represent um, Indigenous communities uh, from Matsqui First Nation, uh, all the Stalo nations, the Camel First Nations, uh, Chehalis, um, all the, the Statlium nations, and all of them are, are, are saying the same thing, that they need to have more jurisdiction um, or complete jurisdiction over federal housing dollars, and I don't disagree with my constituents. And uh, before I, I continue, I made a mistake. Uh, the questions and comments should come in through the Q&A, not the chat. The chat is, is disabled, so I apologize for that. But I see people are using uh, the Q&A. And um, there is a question. Um, are your plans for housing in Canada inclusive of all Canadians? Many vulnerable communities face disproportionate barriers to access housing. Yeah, let me um, share a story just actually from yesterday to answer that question. I was um, visiting with uh, members of the Stallium First Nation and working on some employment objectives that we've been uh, going back and forth on uh, with Indigenous Services Canada. And I asked them about the Rapid Housing Initiative. And the Stallium Nation um, that applied had their app, they were one of the hundred or so applications that were rejected so far uh, because the criteria for derelict housing um, 
wasn't properly met accord, uh, according to the guidelines, and, and this is only what they've told me, but they said that um, e the, their interpretation of it was that even though a lot of the housing on, res uh, housing on reserve is woefully inadequate and probably wouldn't meet the building code standards of many municipalities, the government of Canada in their rejection of their application justified that existing housing as why they weren't qualified for the uh, for the funding um, but so but more more broadly speaking i believe i believe that we need to address the entirety of the housing spectrum um, i've tried to get involved locally as well with haven in the hollow which is um, the shelter and transition housing uh, through mission community services in my riding as well and i'm i we will i i will be recommending that we address the full continuum to be inclusive of the indigenous uh, urban and on reserve indigenous nations as well as all of the other groups in canada since you've touched on the spectrum um I'm, and i'm sure kim is going to want to go there too but we at habitat for humanity we we believe that that there are a lot of uh, attributes of home ownership that that every canadian should have and 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 most want uh, where do you see home ownership in that spectrum and where does the conservative party see home ownership Right. Well, you know, I'm a millennial. I'm 36 years old. And I got into the uh, housing a lot later than some of my, my family members, probably because I was jumping back and forth across Canada working in federal politics. Um, when I decided to settle down, it was the, the price tag just for a, a starter home in Abbotsford where I grew up and where I lived and raised my family um, had jumped like 100% in just a couple of years. Uh, so I was in a position, my, my wife is a public servant, we, we have a high income, and we were able to make it happen. But even today, if you make a really good salary, and you follow all of the rules, your chance of home ownership are becoming less and less in Canada. And I believe that Canada needs to maintain um, a pathway to home ownership for all Canadians, um, as a primary responsibility, because we told people if they go to school, if they go to college, they get that good trade, they get that good university education, they land that job, that they're going to have a reasonable chance of building up home equity and providing that security for the people they love. And I do not want to see that dream go away in Canada. I'm focused on that every single day. Thank you very much. Um, Tim, over to you and I can use my little sign. You are on mute. Okay. I got it. Okay. <laughs> I've been on Zoom calls all day so, because it's the last call of the day. I think I remember to unmute myself finally. <laughs> uh, well, it's uh, I've I found uh, your comments, Brad, really encouraging. Frankly, I, you you answered a lot of my questions before I got a chance to ask them. Maybe I'll ask you when the election is going to be. I don't know if you can tell me that, but um, the Toronto starts at June this morning. So. <laughs> June? Oh, yeah. One year. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my bet. I'm going to lose the pool if that's the case. Anyway, um, it, well, a couple of things. One is, I, it's really encouraging to hear um, that you, you know the Conservative Party is going to be leaning in the direction of maintaining the national housing strategy and and looking for better out housing outcomes uh, for Canadians. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I think I think uh, in fairness, the Conservatives often it's a presumption that. Conservatives don't engage in the housing issue, don't engage in homelessness. And fun fact that some of the, you know, the earliest innovations in ending homelessness in my world were by conservatives, whether it's in in the U.S. and the commitment to end chronic homelessness with uh, President Bush, or in Alberta with Pre Premier Stelmach committing to end homelessness in the province. And uh, so it's it's good to see that uh, sort of that that continuing. I guess my question would be uh, on two items. One is your thoughts on uh, on redu uh, dealing with housing need and homelessness in rural communities that seem to be a particular gap in the national housing strategy, but also, uh, and this I think applies well to habitat families, what we see in core housing need in Canada is a large number of uh, women and single parent households. So in, in particular, about 46% of core housing need is uh, are uh, female led single parent or single female led households uh, or uh, racialized communities and all have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. I'd be very curious to see if, if you had thoughts on, on uh, about those, uh, those groups and areas. 
Yeah, well, actually, yesterday afternoon, I was at the uh, Elizabeth Fry Society in Ashcroft, British Columbia, in the northern part of my riding. And the Elizabeth Fry Society in Ashcroft is a little different than what you would think of Elizabeth for Fry Society and many other communities where they in, deal with solely incarcerated women. Um, in, in, my, in my community of Ashcroft, they are the number one, like, Chari charity at large, they operate a food bank, they operate emergency shelter for, for women, and um, in, in rural communities, and rural women in particular, uh, they, they, frankly, they just don't have a place to go. Um, the BC Housing does, uh, or sorry, they do receive funding through the provincial government for um, uh, hotels if they're in a situation of abuse. Uh, but, but generally speaking, a lot of the programs that we take for granted, even in Mission and Abbotsford and throughout the lower mainland where I live, uh, just don't exist up there. Uh, they um, they don't know that they can go to CMHC uh, for a co-investment fund. They've never even heard of it, frankly, until I told them about it. And they don't even know who to contact at BC Housing about addressing even the basic needs of of uh, of, of, of helping uh, women in need, in particular single mothers um, who are disproportionately impacted uh, by by housing up in that in that community. Uh, so I'm. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question right now or just giving you more information, but I'm, I'm acutely aware that the federal programs uh, don't extend sufficiently enough into all parts of the country. I mentioned earlier data uh, capturing um, to understand the issue, proportionality to community size in terms of how, how um, homelessness and housing in rural communities and Indigenous communities is extremely important data that I hope CMHC begins collecting. Um, but the Reaching Home program, for example, only had $11 million committed annually. And I know the National Alliance uh, to End Rule and Remote Home Homelessness is asking for $50 million. I'm very sympathetic uh, to that type of request when the, pro the problem is just as acute in Ashcroft, in Lillooet, in Cache Creek, where, where I represent, than it is in Toronto, in some cases even more acute. Building on that, if I could for a moment, we did have a question from um, our, our, um, our, our people who are joining us. Um, if we look toward a conservative government, how does the growth in housing support funding reconcile with conservatives recent criticism of current government debt? And that may relate a little to your comment that there, there might be uneven distribution and more resources needed. Right. Um, well, if we're going to speak more broadly about how government has spent money in the last year, first off, we need to look that the Conservative Party was always there for Canadians. And we voted to ensure that all of the major funding support programs and the reform reforms to those programs, which came later, uh, receive conservative support because our number one priority throughout the pandemic was keeping Canadians safe and ensuring that in this time of tragic economic loss and uh, in addition to the, the health challenges that so thousands of Canadian families have faced, uh, that we were there to help them when they really needed the help of government. And I stand by those decisions. Right now, we do find ourselves in a very precarious situation. And even before that, um, the parliament, even before uh, some of the new funding has been announced, the parliamentary budget officer was saying that the spending of the current government cannot be sustainable. These were temporary measures. And we need, to, we need to eventually get people back to work because without people going back to work, the money is going to dry up and people aren't, aren't going to be paying taxes. So that needs to be the focus of our country. That needs to be the focus of our parliament right now. In respect to what the future conservative government is going to do, our first and foremost primary responsibility is to get the economy back up and running. But we will be running deficits for the first few years. That's inevitable. And we will be there to support Canadians and do so in a strategic way. Um, there's a clip, I think it was on C4, when I was asking the finance minister about accountability, because all of the political parties came forward to support this government. But what we didn't receive was the reciprocity. And at the time in December, our public accounts 
outlining where government has spent money and where it had gone had not been updated for almost half a year. We're also going two years without a federal budget. And with a federal budget comes a degree of accountability that is necessary for a functioning democracy that we have not seen in Canada. This is a very unusual time. You are you are sitting in the hot seat, it's for sure. There is a question that's come up that actually people would like all of you to comment on. And this is about the financialization of housing in Canada, which, which is you know the treatment of housing as a commodity and an investment first um, versus being a home and a place of sanctuary. And um, the, uh, the person asking has asked, what are the views of each of our panelists about this topic? and the role that private companies and private sector players um, have in affordable housing. Um, Brad, we put you on the hot spot for, uh, for all these questions at first go. Go so, for it too. <laughs> so why don't, why don't I uh, start with Kevin on this one? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I believe that the private sector and private companies have a role to play or there, there's certainly a place for them in the provision of affordable housing in ways of, of partnerships and, and other types of opportunities there. But at the end of the day, I think it's the nonprofit sector and the co-op sector of this country that has proven time and memorial that an investment in affordable housing through those kinds of venues is what's actually achieved long-term uh, affordability and sustainability at the most cost-effective level um, that, that can be achieved. I think it's it's a nice kind of thought or idea that, that you know, the market can look after this problem, but I think everybody understands the facts are that it's impossible to create uh, housing at a market basis and then try to somehow say you can do uh, rent it out at an affordable rate. Those things do not align. Um, it's really forcing a square peg into a round hole. But I, I do believe there is a role and there's opportunities for that partnership piece to be achieved. But um, the, the affordable housing sector, the nonprofit sector and the co-ops have really proven um, that the way to do this in a sustainable long-term way is to make investments there where it's actually held in perpetuity for the purposes that we as Canadian taxpayers intended those investments to go towards. Tim, would you like to chime in on that next? Oh boy, would I. <laughs> so I, I would say a couple of things. So I think this is a, this is a really, really important topic. Uh, between 2011 and 2016, uh, Canada lost over 320,000 units of affordable rental housing to market behavior, right? So buying up old, older buildings, renovating them, moving them up and charging more rent. That pushes people into the hands of habitat, that pushes people uh, into, uh, into homelessness. To give you a sense, uh, the federal government under the National Housing Strategy aims to build 150,000 new units of housing. Right, so we've in a five year period, we lost 320,000 units. The government is spending billions to build 150,000. Uh, there's an old saying, you know, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Uh, we have to find a way to stop the loss of this housing um, in order for us to have any hope of making sure that all Canadians have safe, decent, and appropriate and affordable housing. I, I do think there is a role for the private sector. We, for example, in Calgary, uh, in my time at the Homeless Foundation, we housed over 4,000 families almost exclusively in market rental housing uh, and individuals and, and families. And so there's a, there's a partnership there, but governments have a role in, to regulate markets. And, and for example, when a company uh, uh, does things that intentionally or accidentally harm the environment or create unsafe conditions or the government step in to regulate to ensure safety. This is something that that markets are doing, market players are doing because they're allowed, but creates significant harm. So what, I guess the question I would have for Brad would, would a conservative government be willing to regulate the private sector in order to con contain or mitigate the damage of, of financialization of rental housing? Okay, so Brad, the, the, the question is the role of private companies and the private sector players in affordable housing, and then Tim's added a layer and, and how, how can the government play vis-a-vis -vis the private sector on this? Um, well, I'll, I'll just start with uh, Tim's question there about, and I, and I will start by saying that I, I recognize, especially in Burnaby, British Columbia, around Metro Town, we saw the negative impacts when a owner of a rental uh, building was able to sell that building 
and uh, make a lot of money, um, but displace some people as well. And in Aaron O'Toole's leadership for the Conservative Party, he actually proposed a capital gains uh, provision that would allow and incentivize old rental buildings to uh, to use profits from that to be to build further rental units. So there is a role for government to play uh, to incentivize the construction of rental units across Canada. Um, think back to the 1970s and 80s when a lot of our rental stock was built and that was through the MERB program and taxation incentives for developers uh, to get into rental construction financing. And I think that's something we need to be looking at very, very closely uh, right now to, to include the private sector in building affordable homes for Canadians um, and not just uh, really expensive condos. Um, we also need to look at the role that municipalities play in their zoning. Um, I live close to, to Vancouver, of course, and they're notorious for having the worst zoning to identify, to create the uh, type of um, housing that will actually serve the needs of Canadian workers so they can live close to where they uh, work every day. And municipalities have a major, major role in, in addressing some of the deficiencies they've put, uh, th their zoning po policies have had on, on this discussion. And that's one of the reasons in my earlier remarks, I mentioned using the federal infrastructure dollars uh, to as, as, and include a housing criteria with them uh, to ensure that the zoning around SkyTrains, for example, uh, stations includes affordable rental units. So we're serving the people that are going to be using these, these infrastructure assets in the first place. Uh, finally, as it relates to housing as a commodification, uh, the CMHC data showed that in, I think, 2016 and 2017, one fifth of condos in Burnaby, exactly where a lot of these rental units in the lower mainland were being torn down, um, one, one in five units were being sold to foreign investors. Now, both provincial, liberal, and NDP governments in the province of BC uh, move forward with a foreign buyers tax. Now, Vancouver has an empty homes tax. We have a satellite families tax. Um, and I just had to do my declaration to, sh to share that I actually lived in my home uh, to the provincial government. Um, so the government absolutely does have a role in ensuring that the uh, foreign buyers into our markets as well um, are not being able to take advantage of our generally lower property taxes and um, using our housing stock as an investment tool. The first primary responsibility of all governments in Canada need to be to house Canadians first. And, and sometimes we've gotten that right. A lot, lots of times we've gotten that wrong. Um, but uh, I, I, of course, as I mentioned earlier too, with the national housing strategy, the federal government does have a role to play in, uh, in cooperatives and in some of the other projects funded through the co-investment fund. Um, but we cannot, we have to encourage the private sector to play a role too. Thank you. And a uh, really interesting survey that came out yesterday from uh, the mortgage professionals of Canada. And, and they uh, found that 70% of Canadians view at their house as as uh, as their place of safety and security and not not as an investment so so we've kind of lined up a bit of a collision course there and good to hear your perspective on that um uh next question is what is the goal of the conservative housing plan certainty affordability and giving canadians a safe place to live uh, but I and I look forward to sharing more once it's completed and I have uh, um, gone through all of that work. But when I think about what I'm doing and what's driving me every day, it's those ideals. I want Canadians to have a safe place to live. I want to make sure that uh, housing first is, is upheld and I want to make sure that our society, um, all elements of our society are being taken care of. So maybe, Julia, I can jump in and say what the headline of the paper should be tomorrow. Conservative Party commits to ending homelessness, I think is what I heard. <laughs> Not to put, to put words in his mouth, but same thing, really. And put Brad's name after the quote, yes. Yeah, I think so. I think that's fair. Well, uh, it, it, it sort of leads to, to a question that, that we've had from, from our gang, which is, is um, uh, well, both actually for Habitat for Humanity Canada, uh, can Habitat Canada play a more involved role in, address, in addressing not just housing, but homelessness directly? 
And is there a precedent for the government of Canada to make capital investments in Habitat for Humanity to target those who maybe fall well below our, our income requirements now? Um, uh, and the conclusion is typically we see the housing continuum as linear. However, why can't people move from homeless to homeowner more often asking for a nation? Uh, Julie, I think you're actually best to answer that question, not me. Um, I don't, you, you obviously know the precedent that um, Habitat for Humanity has in partnering with the federal government. So I think that would be a great area for you to comment. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm hoping I'm speaking on behalf of all my colleagues. Uh, we, we recognize that we, we have a role to uh, advance people where they are on the spectrum and, uh, and whether people are working, living in homelessness, if they are living in transitional shelter, if they're in rental, our goal is to create that pathway and move them towards home ownership uh, and, and, and towards those attributes of home ownership that we all want. And you've, you've, you've all said them probably as, as well as we do, which is safety, security, and a, a place to build your future. And uh, so I think we definitely have a role to play in supporting uh, anybody working um, in, in homelessness um, are we going to play all across the spectrum? No, but we can use our voice and, and use our, use our um, support to help anybody who's working anywhere on the spectrum. Uh, so I'm pretty committed to that. Um, can, I, can I put in a plug for Habitat, Julia? If you don't mind, am I going to say no? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I well, I you know one of the things I've observed of Habitat over the years is that Habitat can plays a really important role in the housing system. If you think of a system from, you know, the the support of housing on one end with the deepest subsidy, the highest support needs for people experiencing homelessness, general sort of affordable housing, but this attainable home ownership can be a super efficient, fairly low cost way. Of, of providing a home and a home ownership for people who are currently living in social housing or affordable housing, creating flow through that system and sustainability. And the habitat model is, is really efficient because they effectively recycle their investment over time. And it can be a really great way of making uh, government dollars uh, stretch a lot further and helping uh, create a healthy housing system. Because we actually just had a great example this morning in your neck of the woods, Tim, in uh, in Alberta, where there's a new townhouse available because the families moved on to their next owned house. Which, uh, and and so the, the you know the the uh, the recycling continues. So it's it is a great model. Um, I did want to turn back to Kevin uh, to see if you had another question for Brad Vies. Yeah, I did. Um... It's, it's really interesting, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know. And when you start to really take a, a federal kind of view of things uh, across the country from coast to coast to coast, you see the different application and the different levels of investment and commitment by provincial governments. And it's extremely disjointed and fractured across this country. In BC, we're quite, we're very fortunate. Um, I think we're leaders in the country for sure in with a government that uh, has a focus on making investments. We can all argue that there could be more, but if we compare and contrast BC to other provinces in the country and really this now ongoing requirement to have provincial governments match or provide some kind of funding to allow these federal programs to work effectively, RHI is a perfect example, Brad, you brought it up earlier. You have 765 applications for you know, $500 million worth of housing units. The challenge with the RHI program is that it's a supply only program and it provides absolutely no funding to support the mostly vulnerable tenants that will uh, call RHI homes their home. Um, what, what is, has the Conservative Party thought about what they could do to ensure that investments across the country are applied consistently and fairly in each province and that if there are requirements for pro provincial governments to make those matching grants how it could be done equally and fairly across uh, the entire country yeah you're you're touching on a lot of uh, great points i i think i might have missed a few points in your question because my zoom just told me my internet connection was a little unstable can you hear me okay right now yeah you want to okay. repeat it, Kevin? Um, that, so can, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Brad, my, my question is really about the fact, uh, what is it the Conservative government could do to support a consistent application in their federal funding when it, it effectively requires provincial matching or, or some kind of provincial contribution? Because what we see is different solutions being rolled out in different provinces, and even some provinces not even taking on the federal investment because they don't want to step up and make their proportionate contribution to the solution. Yeah, there should be. Um, I, I, so you're, you're touching, Kevin, you're touching on like a perennial question that we study in federalism is, should there be a national standard? Uh, should there not be? How do we respect the autonomy of Quebec uh, and all of the regions of Canada and the territories as well? Um, and still making sure that there's equal level of services and funds spent from the federal government in, um, in, uh, in each part of the country. I, I think first and foremost that it starts with having good data. And then once we have good data collection, uh, and I believe CMHC has a role to play there more than they are right now, uh, we can start looking at where there's real deficiencies and apply our policies consistently. But actually one of the things that I hear in, um, in mission uh, with some of the funding that they've received through BC Housing for seniors is that with, with some federal components to it is that they like on building codes, for example, through BC Housing, we're subject to the BC Housing Code, but then to access that federal money, there's all sorts of new building and accessibility requirements on top of what the provincial government is stating. So I think there's a lot of room uh, between the two orders of government uh, to, to choose one path or the other. Um, but I, I think in any federalism question, it's about allowing provinces to have flexibility, but the federal government maintaining through proper data collection, some uniform understanding of what key objectives should be. Uh, I know it's kind of a bit of a bureaucratic answer, uh, but it's really like the, 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 the billion dollar, maybe even trillion dollar question today um, as it relates to, to housing policies. Um, I, I think more broadly speaking, though, we also need to look at doing a regional breakdown of where federal money is going. Um, I give a lot of kudos to my NDP colleague, Jenny Kwan, who outlined in the, in the co-investment fund that it wasn't being equ uh, equitably distributed across this country. And uh, I believe Donald Savoy, he's a, a scholar, uh, uh, the key scholar in Canada on federalism, um, has talked about doing a better job on this for a long time. Thank you. And on that note, we did have a question saying, uh, are you going to do something to balance this conservative viewpoint? And uh, just to let people know, this is the second in our series. And the first was with Minister Hussein. So he provided the liberal viewpoint. And um, speaking of Jenny Kwan, we, we've, uh, we, we, we are a nonpartisan organization and we've had uh, great chats with Leah Gazan and, and, uh, and, and Jenny Kwan. And, and you can look forward to us inviting them to a, a future session. Uh, but today we're really, really uh, very happy to have you here, Brad. Thank you for being so open about this. Sh completely shifting gears and a little bit more to my habitat backdrop. Um, Ed McNabb, who, who is one of the 3D printed homes innovators in Canada, has said uh, current home construction methods are inefficient and expensive. The con um, oh, sorry, I can't see. Do the Conservatives intend to support innovations in construction materials and methods? Uh, uh, th that's an excellent question, and I, I think building code comes up in and in, in what's permissible at the federal level uh, in so many different discussions. I, I think at the federal level, what we need to ensure is that um, our our standards. Uh, so I don't have a direct answer to that question. I should probably say, but generally speaking, uh, I know in in previous committee work and, and my work with the colleagues that and and I would say more broadly the federal government is always looking at ways of improving um, our environmental footprint through uh, our building codes but also making sure that it responds to developers needs and their ability to build homes whatever type it is across this country uh, sometimes I think we can be a little bit more flexible actually um, and uh, about about how the building code is applied but I, I don't have a direct question answer to that question today Okay, and, and there was a similar question about what, what is your view of uh, investment in housing innovation? Um, and I, I think you've, you've, that, you've answered that. Um, and then one comment from, from our friends, housing, um, oh, it's just disappeared. House, they agreed that housing needs to be a nonpartisan issue. It must be on every party's priority list. And I think we can all agree on that. So lots of nods. 
Uh, another comment, support for innovative building methods and creating space for grassroots innovation would be helpful. So now that you've, you've got a few days to finalize that platform, still some little nuggets there. Um, I'm going to ask if, um, uh, if each of Tim and Kevin have a final question, and then maybe I'd turn it over to you, Brad, for some for, for some final comments. Um, Tim, would you like to, is there anything else that you wanted to, to raise? No, I think, you know, this has been a really, uh, really interesting conversation, I guess. Um, the question I would have is how can the folks on the on the line or watching the webinar or uh, those of us working in the sector, how can we support you advancing uh, a, a housing policy that ends homelessness and uh, relieves core housing need in Canada uh, and and uh, support your your work in uh, achieving that? Well, well, thank you for that question. Oh no. And, and first and foremost is that experts on housing and I am, I am not an expert on how, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Oh, oh it froze again. Did I come through again? And I know my internet, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Right. A little in and out. You know? um, Maybe turn your video off, Brad. Could you turn your video off for just a moment? See how we go. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Perfect. You sound great now. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm so sorry about that. No. Um, uh, so, uh, Tim, you know, I really appreciated our conversation the other day. And uh, like I, I, I've said, I don't know if it was heard, but Kevin and Tim are the experts. And what I'm really trying to do uh, right now is hear from the experts, hear from developers, uh, hear from all, the, the millions of Canadians who work in housing in some form or another and try to, there's no silver bullet to solve the problems that we face and it needs to be a multi-pronged approach uh, by all measures. But just having an open dialogue with me, I'm trying to um, address every aspect of the housing continuum um, with an open mind uh, to get it right for Canadians. And uh, uh, yeah, housing necessarily shouldn't, obviously every party is going to have their own approach. But the goal to providing that certainty and a safe place for every Canadian is, is, is something that goes beyond partisan politics. And that's the way we should be treating it. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, was, did you have any final comments or questions that you wanted to share? Yeah, maybe I'll pick up on sort of extend what, what Tim had said. And I just want to really extend it to the Indigenous communities of, this kind of, of the country. You know, it would sure be nice if we could have a time where we could say that we've done what we need to do to support Indigenous Canadians wherever they choose to live, be it on reserve or off reserve, you know, to see a government step up and actually make the investments that are required to really change the direction that this has been going in for far too long. You know, what is it, what do you think, Brad, you guys could do to really change the way this goes? I, I've been doing this for, it feels like too long now because uh, too much of the story as it, uh, as it relates to Indigenous Canadians just has not changed in many, many years. And if there's any one thing you guys could think of to do, it, uh, what do you think it could be? Well, I think it's um, more along the lines uh, without revealing anything, but some of the stuff we've been hearing at committee is for Indigenous and by Indigenous. And in my work with uh, my constituents on reserve, another thing that we need to look at is there's no accountability on the part of Indigenous Services Canada to the people that they're purportedly serving. I am shocked. I asked the, I actually had the committee chair the other day write a letter back to the department because I asked some very basic questions. How many people at Indigenous Services Canada work on housing? How, how, many, uh, how many dollars are spent annually on, on Indigenous housing in Canada through Indigenous Services Canada? What's the proportion of administration versus direct construction costs uh, for these programs? And I was not able to get a straight answer back from the department. CMHC was able to give me an answer and it was fulsome. But I'm always at a loss as to why the federal government is unable to, when they're purportedly there to help people, are unable to give very basic points of data about how much money and how many people are working on such a big issue. Uh, and I know that information exists, but they're refusing even to give it to us on Parliament. So I had uh, our committee chair 
uh, write another letter back with the support of all of my committee colleagues to get some basic information. Uh, so when I what I hear from my Indigenous constituents is they want me to keep fighting for some accountability in the departments that impact their life every day because the service standard given to Indigenous Canadians is not sufficient and it's wrong. And oftentimes these big decisions about how people at Chehalis or in the Statlium Nations is made, is made by a public servant in Ottawa who's never even been on their traditional territory or, and, and where they've lived forever. And uh, they're having these big decisions on these people's lives that is just not acceptable. And there's a better way to do it in the 21st century. So if I can keep raising, um, I'm going to keep raising my constituents' concerns that way, but I, I believe there needs to be a new service standard model uh, for public servants as well. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to ask you, Brad, if there, if you want to make a few, few closing remarks, you actually started off by uh, welcoming people to share the comments with you or perspective. And, and um, uh, I haven't been able to go back and make sure I got your email address ready. Some, some, right. Somebody did ask for that to be uh, repeated. So if, if you're comfortable sharing that again, how can people stay in touch with you and how are you going to stay in touch with housing stakeholders and uh, anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, well, thank you. So first off, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I, I hope my comments today demonstrate that the Conservative Party, uh, through my work, is really trying to get some things right. Of course, our housing policies have yet to be finalized, but I think my comments today gave some idea of the approach I want to take and, and, and how we can work together to uh, address homelessness and get people housed and, and make a difference in, in the lives of millions of people who don't have what they need. Um, so I'm focused on that and I wanna work with everyone. So my email is brad.vis at parl, P -A -R -L dot G -C dot C -A, And I believe it was just put into the chat if everyone can uh, see that. Um, but and in terms of being in contact with me, I, I wanna hear from people who are on the ground. I came into this, I do have a background in policy development, so I know how to approach a problem, um, but I can't approach a problem unless I hear from the people who have devoted their entire lives uh, to working on these issues. And for me, it's only been a few months. Uh, so I really depend on the expertise of others to try to get this right. And I'm always open or Blair in my office, who's um, uh, behind me um, working to, uh, to, to be in contact. And uh, I just, I'm really thankful for the opportunity. And um, I'm also going to be try to focus a bit more on on rural housing as well because I, I see it so clearly in my riding and it's been a bit of a, a culture shock at some points too since I've been elected uh, to see some of the poverty that exists so close to where I live. Um, yeah, that's that's basically it. Really enjoyed the discussion. Well, uh, you know, the thanks are ours and Blair did provide your contact details. Not everybody can see the chat, but we will be sharing the recording and we'll also uh, share the contact information for Brad Viss with, with that. Uh, we'll send it around to everybody who's participated. Um, really want to thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, I, I was saying earlier when I met you in the fall, I could tell you are a voracious learner and, and you're open to hearing things. And you made that really clear today. And you showed your, your passion for an issue that, that all of us care so, so deeply about and all Canadians care about. And uh, uh, we really thank you for, for bringing us up to speed on your thinking and, and the party's thinking. Um, and uh, so thank you again for, for making this time for us. Uh, Tim and Kevin, you, uh, as Brad said, you've been in, you've been at this for a long time. You're, you're gods of housing. Uh, you do such amazing work. We, we are so grateful to count you as partners and allies and uh, uh, look forward to continuing uh, our good work together. And for everybody who's joined us today, thank you for giving an hour um, at some point in your day. Uh, wish you um, uh, a happy Valentine's Day, happy family day. And most importantly, if you're celebrating uh, Lunar New Year, or whatever, whatever, you, whatever you're saying, but uh, hope, hopefully you have a weekend of rest and celebration with family. Thank you all again, and uh, we'll look forward to letting you know about our next um, session in this series. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.